Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in sophomore English. We turn now in our unit 3. We're studying different kinds of essays. We looked at exposition. We looked at the reflective essay. Now we're looking at humorous uh, text. We just finished with uh, the Twain passage where he celebrates and ridicules weather in New England. We now turn to the James Thurber text, The Dog That Bit People, which is of course a fascinating uh, little title. Before we get there on page 525 though, just go back to page 518 for just a second and take a look just to remind yourself in 2B. We are working with the humorous essay or speech, okay? Now in this case, the humorous essay by Thurber. Uh, again, we're not talking about necessarily being funny. Remember that. When we talk academically about humor, we're usually talking about something else. The unexpected, maybe the amusing, the use of hyperbole or exaggeration, and the understatement as well. Now, there can always be an element of satire involved in this, and we're always paying attention to diction, to the connotation of words, and to the tone of the writer. All of that's going to factor into our study here of this real brief little, uh, little essay. Now, Thurber you already know from your freshman year, because you'll remember we studied The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, one of Thurber's famous stories about an old man, you'll maybe remember, who thought he was in involved in all these adventures, and in fact he, didn't, he, he wasn't having any adventure at all. He was being sent to the store by his wife to go buy a, you know, puppy biscuits. Okay, That's the James Thurber of this story as well. Thurber, look at your dates and information on 519. Let's just do some quick biography. Note your dates, 1894 to 1961. A native of Columbus, Ohio, Thurber went to work for the U.S. State Department after college. Soon afterwards, however, he found his true calling. He became a humorist, writing essays and drawing cartoons for The New Yorker, a famous magazine. One more example of a famous American writer who ended up in journalism of a kind. Thurber won fame by his whimsical descriptions of human and animal silliness. By the 1940s, though, his failing eyesight forced him to reduce the number of cartoon drawings he created. By the way, I really do recommend that you Google image uh, James Thurber and Google uh, image, and you'll see his cartoons. They're amazing. He's really good. He's very gifted with his cartoon drawings. By 1952, Thurber was almost totally blind. He still wrote stories and articles for the magazine, The New Yorker. His collections, in including the Thurber Carnival of 1945, are considered classics of humor writing. And I, I will say this, uh, I've said it to you before, guys. Uh, by the way, there's one of the drawings of Thurber on page 525, just to give you a sense of it. Um, I've, I've said this before. One of the reasons why we enjoy this kind of approach in an anthology is that you look at something by Thurber and then you go online and you find a whole lot more by Thurber, including his cartoons. And put a note to yourself, there's a, there's a really um, uh, cool uh, YouTube video that you can find of Thurber's that tells a story through only pictures that uh, you might challenge yourself to take a look at. It's pretty remarkable as well, about two people who find a flower and the whole story of what happens when these two people who are lovers find a flower. Take a look at it. You'll enjoy it. All right, let's go. The dog that bit people. Let's talk a little bit about this one. In this one, Thurber is going to use exaggeration. She'll write that down. I'm going to ask you, where are the examples of exaggeration? To contrast and, and, um, exaggeration and contrast to achieve humor. He's going to demonstrate that humor is a combination of the keen observation of details and unique style of reporting these details. So as we get into this one, I'm going to ask you at the end of this one, what's humor? It's just like we did about the Twain uh, passage as well. All right, you ready? Let's pay attention now. A short reading, not a real long reading, but a lot of fun. Let's enjoy it. The genius of Thurber, shall we? The Dog That Bit People by James Thurber. Probably no man should have as many dogs in his life as I have had, but there was more pleasure than distress in them for me, except in the case of an Airedale named Muggs. He gave me more trouble than all the other 54 or 5 put together, although my moment of keenest embarrassment was the time a Scotch terrier named Jeannie, who had just had six puppies in the clothes closet of a fourth floor apartment in New York, had the unexpected 7th and last at the corner of 11th Street and 5th Avenue during a walk she had insisted on taking. Then, too, there was the prize-winning French poodle, a great big black poodle, none of your little untroublesome white miniatures, who got sick riding in the rumble seat of a car with me on her way to the Greenwich Dog Show. She had a red rubber bib tucked around her throat and since a rainstorm came up when we were halfway through the Bronx, I had to hold over her a small green umbrella, really more of a parasol. 
The rain beat down fearfully, and suddenly the driver of the car drove into a big garage filled with mechanics. It happened so quickly that I forgot to put the umbrella down, and I will always remember, with sickening distress, the look of incredulity mixed with hatred that came over the face of the particular hardened garage man that came over to see what we wanted. Flight when 26. he took a look at me and the poodle, all garage men and people of that intolerant stripe hate poodles with their curious haircut, especially the pom-poms that you've got to leave on their hips if you expect the dogs to win a prize. But the Airedale, as I have said, was the worst of all my dogs. He really wasn't my dog, as a matter of fact. I came home from a vacation one summer to find that my brother Roy had bought him while I was away. A big, burly, choleric dog, he always acted as if he thought I wasn't one of the family. There was a slight advantage in being one of the family, for he didn't bite the family as often as he bit strangers. Still, in the years that we had him, he bit everybody but mother, and he made a pass at her once but missed. That was during the month when we suddenly had mice, and Muggs refused to do anything about them. Nobody ever had mice exactly like the mice we had that month. They acted like pet mice, almost like mice somebody had trained. They were so friendly that one night, when Mother entertained at dinner the Freira Liras, a club she and my father had belonged to for 20 years, she put down a lot of little dishes with food in them on the pantry floor so that the mice would be satisfied with that and wouldn't come into the dining room. Muggs stayed out in the pantry with the mice, lying on the floor, growling to himself, not at the mice, but about all the people in the next room that he would have liked to get at. Mother slipped out into the pantry once to see how everything was going. Everything was going fine. It made her so mad to see Muggs lying there, oblivious of the mice, they came running up to her, that she slapped him and he slashed at her, but didn't make it. He was sorry immediately, Mother said. He was always sorry, she said, after he bit someone. But we could not understand how she figured this out. He didn't act sorry. Mother used to send a box of candy every Christmas to the people the Airedale bit. The list finally contained 40 or more names. Nobody could understand why we didn't get rid of the dog. I didn't understand it very well myself, but we didn't get rid of him. I think that one or two people tried to poison Muggs. He acted poisoned once in a while, and old Major Moberly fired at him once with his service revolver near the Seneca Hotel in East Broad Street. But Muggs lived to be almost 11 years old, and even when he could hardly get around, he bit a congressman who had called to see my father on business. My mother had never liked the congressman. She said the signs of his horoscope showed he couldn't be trusted. He was Saturn with the moon in Virgo. But she sent him a box of candy that Christmas. He sent it right back, probably because he suspected it was trick candy. Mother persuaded herself it was all for the best that the dog had bitten him, even though father lost an important business association because of it. I wouldn't be associated with such a man, Mother said. Mugs could read him like a book. 527. We used to take turns feeding Muggs to be on his good side, but that didn't always work. He was never in a very good humor, even after a meal. Nobody ever knew exactly what was the matter with him, but whatever it was, it made him irascible, especially in the mornings. Roy never felt very well in the morning either, especially before breakfast. And once, when he came downstairs and found that Muggs had moodily chewed up the morning paper, he hit him in the face with a grapefruit and then jumped up on the dining room table, scattering dishes and silverware and spilling the coffee. Muggs's first free leap carried him all the way across the table and into a brass fire screen in front of the gas grate. But he was back on his feet in a moment, and in the end, he got Roy and gave him a pretty vicious bite in the leg. Then he was all over it. He never bit anyone more than once at a time. Mother always mentioned that as an argument in his favor. 
She said he had a quick temper, but that he didn't hold a grudge. She was forever defending him. I think she liked him because he wasn't well. He's not strong, she would say pityingly, but that was inaccurate. He may not have been well, but he was terribly strong. One time, my mother went to the Chittenden Hotel to call on a woman mental healer who was lecturing in Columbus on the subject of harmonious vibrations. She wanted to find out if it was possible to get harmonious vibrations into a dog. He's a large, tan-colored Airedale, Mother explained. The woman said that she had never treated a dog, but she advised my mother to hold the thought that he did not bite and would not bite. Mother was holding the thought the very next morning when Muggs got the Iceman, but she blamed that slip-up on the Iceman. If you didn't think he would bite you, he wouldn't, Mother told him. He stomped out of the house in a terrible jangle of vibrations. One morning, when Muggs bit me slightly, more or less in passing, I reached down and grabbed his short, stumpy tail and hoisted him into the air. It was a foolhardy thing to do, and the last time I saw my mother, about six months ago, she said she didn't know what possessed me. I don't either, except that I was pretty mad. As long as I held the dog off the floor by his tail, he couldn't get at me. But he twisted and jerked so, snarling all the time, that I realized I couldn't hold him that way very long. I carried him to the kitchen and flung him onto the floor and shut the door on him just as he crashed against it. But I forgot about the back stairs. Five twenty-eight. Monks went up the back stairs and down the front stairs and had me cornered in the living room. I managed to get up onto the mantelpiece above the fireplace, but it gave way and came down with a tremendous crash, throwing a large marble clock, several vases, and myself heavily to the floor. Muggs was so alarmed by the racket that when I picked myself up, he had disappeared. We couldn't find him anywhere, although we whistled and shouted until old Mrs. Detweiler called after dinner that night. Muggs had bitten her once in the leg, and she came into the living room only after we assured her that Muggs had run away. She had just seated herself when, with a great growling and scratching of claws, Muggs emerged from under a Davenport where he had been quietly hiding all the time, and bit her again. 529. Mother examined the bite and put arnica on it and told Mrs. Detweiler that it was only a bruise. He just bumped you, she said. But Mrs. Detweiler left the house in a nasty state of mind. Lots of people reported our Airedale to the police, but my father held a municipal office at the time and was on friendly terms with the police. Even so, the cops had been out a couple of times, once when Muggs bit Mrs. Rufus Sturdivant and again when he bit Lieutenant Governor Malloy. But Mother told them that it hadn't been Muggs's fault, but the fault of the people who were bitten. When he starts for them, they scream, she explained, and that excites him. The cops suggested that it might be a good idea to tie the dog up, but Mother said that it mortified him to be tied up and that he wouldn't eat when he was tied up. Muggs at his meals was an unusual sight. Because of the fact that if you reach toward the floor, he would bite you, we usually put his food plate on the top of an old kitchen table with a bench alongside the table. Muggs would stand on the bench and eat. I remember that my mother's uncle Horatio, who boasted that he was the third man up Missionary Ridge, was splutteringly indignant when he found out that we fed the dog on a table because we were afraid to put his plate on the floor. He said he wasn't afraid of any dog that ever lived, and that he would put the dog's plate on the floor if we would give it to him. Roy said that if Uncle Horatio had fed mugs on the ground just before the battle, he would have been the first man up Missionary Ridge. Uncle Horatio was furious. Bring him in! Bring him in now! He shouted. I'll feed the... on the floor! Roy was all for giving him a chance, but my father wouldn't hear of it. He said that Muggs had already been fed. I'll feed him again, bawled Uncle Horatio. We had quite a time quieting him. 
In his last year, Muggs used to spend practically all of his time outdoors. He didn't like to stay in the house for some reason or other. Perhaps it held too many unpleasant memories for him. Anyway, it was hard to get him to come in, and as a result, the garbage man, the ice man, and the laundry man wouldn't come near the house. We had to haul the garbage down to the corner, take the laundry out and bring it back, and meet the ice man a block from home. After this had gone on for some time, we hit on an ingenious arrangement for getting the dog in the house so that we could lock him up while the gas meter was read and so on. Muggs was afraid of only one thing, an electrical storm. Thunder and lightning frightened him out of his senses. I think he thought a storm had broken the day the mantelpiece fell. He would rush into the house and hide under a bed or in a clothes closet. Five thirty. So we fixed up a thunder machine out of a long, narrow piece of sheet iron with a wooden handle on one end. Mother would shake this vigorously when she wanted to get Muggs into the house. It made an excellent imitation of thunder, but I suppose it was the most roundabout system for running a household that was ever devised. It took a lot out of Mother. A few months before Muggs died, he got to seeing things. He would rise slowly from the floor, growling low, and stalk stiff-legged and menacing toward nothing at all. Sometimes, the thing would be just a little to the right or left of a visitor. Once a fuller brush salesman got hysterics. Muggs came wandering into the room like Hamlet following his father's ghost. His eyes were fixed on a spot just to the left of the fuller brush man, who stood it until Muggs was about three slow creeping paces from him. Then he shouted. Muggs wavered on past him into the hallway, grumbling to himself, but the fuller man went on shouting. I think Mother had to throw a pan of cold water on him before he stopped. That was the way she used to stop us boys when we got into fights. Muggs died quite suddenly one night. Mother wanted to bury him in the family lot under a marble stone with some such inscription as, Flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. But we persuaded her it was against the law. In the end, we just put up a smooth board above his grave along a lonely road. On the board, I wrote with an indelible pencil, Cave Canum. Mother was quite pleased with the simple classic dignity of the old Latin epitaph. All right, let's go ahead now and just uh, take a look at level one and just work through the essay. This humorous, reflective piece, that a uh, humorous piece that tells us a little bit about a story about, uh, you know, his dog, right? So let's begin really quickly. Notice the exaggerations that begin right away on 525. It tells us we're reading Thurber, and of course Thurber loves his exaggerations. So we start out, notice, by being told that he had in his lifetime 54 or 55 different dogs, and he talks about a couple of them. It's most likely that these are, of, this is a bit of an exaggeration. Notice that finally we get to this, the, the, to the dog that he'll be writing about, right, in Muggs, over on page 526. Notice this is a dog, an Airedale, that will bite everything and everyone, but he won't chase after the mice. Note the irony that it's mom in the story who loves this dog, right, who takes care of this dog and loves this dog. Of course, the irony on 526 is the dog's lying there on the floor with all the mice. He won't chase the mice. The mice actually come up to the mother, right, and say, hi, how's it going when she comes into the room, right? Notice, uh, notice as well, we've got, this, we've got the story of sending candy boxes, right, to all the people who get bit. Over 40 of them, we're told. And this, again, may be exaggeration as well. Um, on to page 527, um, uh, the, uh, we've got the mother who's always defending him. She, I think she liked him because he wasn't well, uh, we read. He's not strong, she would say, pittingly, but that was inaccurate. He may not have been well, but he was terribly strong. Of course, we realize that the voice in, in, this, in this essay is the voice of a, of a, young, of a young boy, right, who's ref, or is referencing it. He, she tries to get these harmonious vibrations into the dog, and of course that's kind of a joke. Um, he picks him up, a memory, he picks the dog up by its tail, 
And the dog, of course, can't bite him, but the problem is you got to let the dog go, and of course the dog's going to run around the house and corner him, and then you've got the crashing down of hiding up on the uh, mantelpiece. Then we've got the, the uh, cops who, are, uh, who um, you know, should probably have been uh, told about this, and they, and they kind of stay out of it. Mom's always making excuses on 529, for example. When he starts for them, they scream, and that excites him. The, the cops suggested that maybe we tie him up, but we can't do it. Then mugs at mealtime is one of the more interesting ones. Uncle Horatio, of course, can't believe it. Wait a minute, let me get this straight. You have the drawing, right, of um, Thurber's drawing on 528. Yeah, we don't put his plate down on the floor. We let him stand up on the table. And, of course, Uncle Horatio, who has been uh, at, the, at one of the great battles at Missionary Ridge, the second up, uh, he's, he's like, I'll take care of it. We have... As well, of course, the joking about and the irony about thunder is the only thing that frightens the dog. And so they make this thunder machine, right? Finally, we have references to Hamlet, which you'll appreciate only after your senior year, but put it at 3A nonetheless. We have references to Hamlet, who uh, we're told is going to kind of reference what happens to Muggs at the end, where Hamlet's chasing after his father's ghost. And then at the very end of the play, Hamlet, when he is dead... Uh, Horatio, his best friend, will sing, will say, Flights of angels, sing thee to thy rest, the lines at the very end. We finish with a Latin reference to beware of the dog, and that's the end of our story. Now, let's jump to uh, 2A really quickly. What's a major message or theme here? The love of animals is always one of those that's hard to explain, right? Notice the mother in our, in our uh, story here, the mother loves this dog, and so she won't, she won't let anybody talk bad about the dog, right? Always making excuses for the dog and the like. You do get a sense that Thurber himself, while he was frightened of this dog, this, this Airedale, that he loved this dog as well. Maybe the dog had a certain kind 